You know, we're living in days where you turn on a radio or a television or a computer stream of news, and it's like a case study on how words um, are being used to try and manipulate and persuade. And after a while, it could just be exhausting, right? And yet, um, just because we're going through a particular season right now, it, that will never change. Um, people are always trying to persuade one another or manipulate one another to do what we want them to do so that we might get what we want. And, and sometimes that can um, spill over into our relationship with God. And so I thought in today's story that we're going to be looking at in the book of Judges that I would want to talk to you a little bit about what is, that this, what is the life that God really blesses? Because after all, that's, that's what we all really want to experience, right? And where, it is, where is it that we ought to start? Well, as we've been studying through the book of Judges, we've, we've been recognizing that people in, in, uh, in this period of time, well, they were starting in the wrong place. And um, we've been going through this idea of a cycle, right? Where we talked about sin and how sin led to oppression and how oppression then led to people crying out in their distress. And then God in his grace would raise up a deliverer. He would bring victory to the, to the land uh, of Israel and give them peace. And so this cycle is repeated over and over again, only sometimes at that cycle it begins to start um, missing a bunch of those kinds of pieces. So why don't we start looking again at another story today in the book of Judges in chapter 10. And let's look at the first of those cycles where we talk about sin. Because in Judges chapter 10, verse 6, I want you to take note of something that may not appear as obvious when you go through, the, when you go through this list. So um, I'm going to put a map up on the screen for you now. And um, as I read a text, I just want you to you know, uh, pay attention because it says, again, the Israelites did evil in the eyes of the Lord. They served the Baals and the Ashtoreths. Those were the gods of fertility that were part of the Canaanite, you know, pantheon of gods. But notice it goes on now, and it says they also served, what? The gods of Aram and the gods of Sidon, which was all the way over on the coast of the Mediterranean, where um, also known as Phoenicia. And the, they served the gods of Moab and the gods of the Ammonites and the gods of the Philistines. I want you to notice that in the addition of, there, there's all these false gods now, and it's the most elaborate accounting in, in, uh, in the book of Judges. And it's beginning to demonstrate more and more how they have become to syncretize all of these various gods into their um, uh, worship of God, uh, as we know him as the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And so what they've done is they've gone, become so enculturated that it just brought about the displeasure of God. And that led to this sense of oppression. And so staying on that map again for just a moment, I want you to, I want you to recognize something. It says that because of, of their idolatrous behavior, it says that the Lord became angry with them and he sold them into the hands of, Notice here, it says the Philistines and the Ammonites. And on your map, do you do notice right there in two separate places? So it's like the two um, blades of a scissor that are coming to bear on Israel that's caught in the middle. And what's going to happen? It says in that year, the Ammonites would come and shatter and crush them. For 18 years, they oppressed all the Israelites on the east side of the Jordan in Gilead, the land of the Amorites. The Amorites also crossed the Jordan to fight against Judah and Benjamin and the house of Ephraim, and Israel was in great distress. So you can see on this map that they are crossing over this Jordan River and coming to bear on all three of these tribes of Israel it's beginning to escalate more and more as you read through the book of Judges. Why? Because God is angry, and he's bringing his justice to bear on Israel. 
And now he's raising up nations like the Philistines and Ammon that are geographically on both sides so that there's little escape, so that they're crushed and shattered and they're just left in great distress. And so in that distress, it's not unusual then for us to hear, to, to, to hear their cry. But I want you to notice that very often, as we have been growing accustomed in this book, a cry of distress then usually led to God, you know, uh, expressing grace towards his people. But I want you to notice in verse 10 of Judges chapter 10 that the cry is going unheeded. They, they, they cry out to God and they say, we have sinned against you, forsaking our God and serving the Baals. Now, you notice it says our God? Our God underscores that they recognize their unique relationship with the God that, that, uh, that God has with them. It, this is our God over against the Baals. But God wasn't one God among many. The, the, the scriptures reveal a God who created the heavens and the earth. He's only one God. He is the one in whom we live and move and have our very being. He's the one that gives life. Their false gods were, um, were just giving expression to things that just were not true. And so they say, they cry out, but notice God's reply. He says to them, he says, the Lord replies, says, look, when the Egyptians, the Amorites, the Ammonites, which, and as you've been following, if you've been following along in the book of Judges, you realize that Ehud was a judge that fought against the Ammonites. And the Philistines, there was another judge by the name of Shamgar who came and killed over 600 with just a rod. He says the Sidonians, well, that was Barak. And the Amalekites and the, and the Midianites, well, that was Gideon. God says, you do remember, right, when all these nations oppressed you and you cried to me for help? He goes, did I not save you? But now this is becoming a repeated theme with them. And so notice what God says. He says, but I will no longer save you. He says, go and cry out to the gods that you've chosen. Let them save you when you're in trouble. Now, they, they turn around and, um, and they express what appears to be true repentance. Look at verse 15 and 16. He says, we have sinned. Do with us whatever you think best, but please rescue us now. In other words, do what you got to do, but just remove this, you know, oppression from us right now. And then they, they, it says in 16 that they got rid of the foreign gods among them and served the Lord. And he says, and he could bear Israel's misery no longer. I just want to sit here for a moment on that one text because it all sounds really good, doesn't it? Except when you get to the end here, it says that, that God could bear Israel's misery no longer. The word there for could, to bear no longer is a word that in other places in the New Testament speaks of an impatience or a weariness. And that word misery has to deal with work that is being expressed. And so what this is really saying is that God is becoming impatient with their, with, their, their, with their exercise of, uh, of worship, of the way in which they are living out this life. And so God is beginning to turn a deaf ear to them. When they say, do whatever you think is best, well, evidently God thought it best to repay their apostasy with the oppression of the surrounding nations. That's what God thought was best, giving them a taste of their own medicine. And it appears that all they've done is double down because now it wasn't just the gods of the, of the Canaanites that they were worshiping. Now it was the gods of all the surrounding regions. It's like, hey, we may, we may as well appeal to them all because you never know who's going to you know, come through for you. And so not only have they disregarded God's decree to displace these nations in an act of divine justice, but they turned around and engaged in the very idolatrous, idolatrous worship they were being asked to remove. And so you're left wondering, are their actions really sincere? Are their actions simply a means of appeasement, just trying to get on God's good side so 
you know, he would remove, you know, this threat. And, and are their actions a conversion, really, or is it just a conversion of convenience? But you know what's interesting? God offers no promise to raise up a deliverer. What follows is silence on God's part. Think about that. In all the other places, we went through that cycle, right? Sin that led to oppression, that led to them crying out in distress, that led to God showing grace by raising up another leader. But what I want you to notice in our story is that that's a piece that's missing. And I want to just stop here for a moment, and I want you to think about all the, you know, the things that, that are being said in this text and what's not being said. It appears that they're just going through the motions. God's lack of action is notable because God always responds to a truly repentant heart when it's demonstrated not only with words, but with actions. So the fact that God is silent in our text underscores the fact that their pain that they were experiencing was really not enough to produce a sincere repentance. They were simply going through the motions. It made me think of a New Testament text where Jesus confronted the Pharisees and teachers of the law who had asked him a question as to why uh, his disciples were breaking the tradition of the elders, that they didn't wash their hands before they ate. It was a way of which they, they uh, demonstrated this outward sense of purity and, 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 and godliness, right? And it was part of their traditions. And, and yet in Matthew chapter 15, 8 through 11, Jesus sees right through their re religiosity. And, and this is how Jesus responds. He says, these people honor me with their lips, but their hearts are far from me. They worship me in vain. Their teachings are rules taught by men. And then Jesus called the crowd to him and said, listen and understand. What goes into a man's mouth doesn't make him unclean, but what comes out of his mouth, that is what makes him unclean. And then he went on to add that the things that come out of the mouth come from the heart, and that is what makes a man unclean. For out of the heart comes evil thoughts and murder and adulteries, and sexual immorality, theft, false testimony, slander. As we have said many, many times, see, that's where the true battle is. They were going through all the motions to make it seem like they were this, you know, spiritual people. And all the while, they were engaged in this pluralism, in this syncretism of taking a little bit of this God and this God as, as if they were eating at a spiritual buffet. We cannot experience God's best when we simply go through the motions. See, God has called us to put his word into practice, to let it be seen in the way in which we love God and neighbor. So that's the first challenge that you begin to read through this book, and one in which I think it would do, it'd do us well on, uh, on occasions to just sit back and say, Am I really just going through the motions? Or do I, am I really seeking to know God and to allow His way to shape mine? You see, we all want grace, right? And, and grace is offered. But it is here that that cycle that I was telling you about sin and oppression and distress and then God's grace this is where it begins to break down a little bit because usually it's God who is going to raise up a deliverer. It's God who brings victory and it's God who grants peace in the land. But as we will discover in this situation that we're reading in Israel, it's become so bleak that God is removing his hand in very significant ways. So let's talk a little bit about this grace and and, and look at it in the context as we see Jephthah being introduced. In Judges chapter 11, verses 1 through 3, if you were to read that text, you'd discover that Jephthah is called a mighty warrior. Where did we hear that term before? But from Gideon, right? We find out that his father is a Gilead from the tribe of Manasseh. What you also find 
is that his mother is a prostitute, maybe a temple prostitute, one who engaged in these uh, ritual ceremonies that they would try to appease the gods in a way to manipulate them to get what they wanted. And somehow in this little tryst that uh, Gilead had with this prostitute, well, Jephthah is born. But it goes on in the text to tell us that Gilead had another wife, and she bore sons, and they're, and they're mentioned, and they're laid across the illegitimacy of Jephthah standing among his brothers. Look what it says in verse 2. It says, the brothers are saying to Jephthah, you're not going to get any inheritance in our family, they said, because you are the son of another woman. When you look at that text, greed is their motivation. They don't want to share any inheritance with him. Social superiority is the ground for their rejection. We're better than you. You're the son of a prostitute. And it's worth noting that Israelite inheritance laws did not depend on the mother, but on the father. But again, you see, here as a people now, it appears that God's word has little value for them. It, they're not allowing the word of God to define them as a community of faith. They're not aspiring to these principles that God has laid down. No, it's all about what they're going to get, what they're not going to get. And so it tells us in verse 3 that Jephthah fled from his brothers, and he basically went out and he formed his own gang. You know, reading between the lines here, you recognize that Jephthah's childhood contributed to his aggressive behavior. And no doubt, he left home with a chip on his shoulder with something to prove. You know, just as in the story of Abimelech, in this leadership style that we're going to see of Jephthah, we're again confronted with the tragic effects that arise from treating leadership as just a matter of power, rather than looking at leadership, godly leadership, as a call to service on behalf of those who are being led. So, as I said before, right, usually God in his grace raised up a leader, a, raised up a deliverer. But I want you to notice how Jephthah is recruited. Looking at Judges 11 verses 4 through 11, you'll discover that there's no mention of any pause on, on, the, on the part of, of uh, those from Gilead to seek out God's will. And so they're looking at a human problem. Ammon is coming in to destroy them. There is this threat, but they're going to make a very secular decision to a very human problem. They want to go out and get the biggest gun that they can to put down this oppression. But notice from this point on, God is silent. Instead of God being the one to usher in this new deliverer and save the day, God has nothing to say, and he lets them take uh, stage front and center. Because Israel is embroiled now in a war with Ammon, and that, and that, and that oppression has come because of their, of their apostasy. But the elders of Gilead, what happens? Instead of crying out to God in true repentance, no, they hear about this Jephthah, they know of him, and they solicit his help since he has a reputation as a mighty warrior. And notice Jephthah's response to them. He says, um, let me get this straight. You chased me out of my father's house, basically, right? He says, didn't you hate me and drive me from my father's house? Why do you come to me now when you're in trouble? And so they appealed to his self-interest. They said, hey, we want you to be, you know, the commander. We want you to be the head over Gilead. And they go back and forth. And eventually in verse 10 and 11, it says, the elders of Gilead replied, the Lord is our witness. We will certainly do as you say. Which implied that there was this negotiations that were taking place between Jephthah and Gilead, if you, when you read the story, you realize they, they first ask him to be their commander, and, 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 uh, and, Ge and, and Jephthah's reply is that, how do I know when this is all over that there's still going to be a place for me? 
So he's negotiating for something bigger than just being their commander. He wants to be the head of the elders themselves. And so that's exactly what they did. They said, this is, we'll do exactly as you say. So Jephthah went down with the elders of Gilead and the people made him, notice, head and commander over them. And he repeated all of his words before the Lord in Mizpah. You notice that appeal is made to the Lord? But here's the problem. There appears to be a glaring absence from God in all of these deliberations. Up to this point, God led out in providing his grace, right? By raising up a deliverer, procuring victory, establishing peace. And while in these texts we're going to see references to God are being made, it appears that these words are mere formalities. You know, kind of like when one says, if God is my witness. Well, those words only hold meaning when they're authenticated by a life that truly knows God and walks in the ways of God. Sometimes I think when people say, well, God is my witness, God is like saying, well, like, who are you? Because I don't even know you. See, otherwise, these words, they're just like giving a nod. They're, it's a way of appearing to be godly. So there is this form of religion, but it doesn't have any power. So where, what's the story then, really, in all of this? Well, I think it's, the story is going to be found in the condition of Jephthah's heart. And what is that condition? Well, we're given some glimpses here. First, we notice that he negotiates with the elders of Gilead. He was definitely looking out for himself, for position, for power, for privilege. And once he got that position, once again, he uses his negotiation skills with the Ammonites. He, he, sends a, he takes charge. He sends an official envoy to the king of Ammon. And it's apparent that Jephthah is speaking for the people. And so he engages the king of Ammon and he offers this political speech that invokes historical records, theological records, chronological arguments, all of which to make his point and to try to settle this dispute with Ammon. He obviously, though, had no intention of peacefully turning this region of Gilead over to the Ammonites. They were, after all, the oppressors. And, um, and there's one more thing, though. So not only is he negotiating for his position and power and status here, right, his privilege, and then we see those same skills again trying to manipulate what's going on in this present conflict, but now we're going to see that there's an attempt to manipulate God and to secure concessions and favors from God like he had from the Gileadites and the Ammonites. And Jephthah is going to make a vow that's unique to this passage in the Bible and just sheds further light on the condition of Jephthah's heart. Look at verses 30 and 31 of Judges chapter 11. He says, Jephthah made a vow to the Lord. If you give the Ammonites into my hands, can I just stop there for a moment? Into my hands? I, I, I thought that, that the, um, the victories were supposed to be as a sign of God's you know, righteous judgment against these warring nations that Israel was to be setting itself apart, but now they're all part of the problem. And, and now even for, for Jephthah, he's looking at this for his own personal aggrandizement. So he's saying, if you give the Ammonites into my hands, whatever comes out of the door of my house to meet me when I return in triumph from the Ammonites will be the Lord's, and I will sacrifice it as a burnt offering. You see what's really going on here? Jephthah needs the win. He has the most to lose. Remember, he's, he's like this son of a prostitute, you know, chased out of his own home. He has no standing. When he, when he, when he leaves, he just uh, you know, uh, assembles for himself this uh, group of bandits that come together. So, now being chosen, now in this position, he doesn't want to lose it. Everything, his title, his standing, would be taken away unless 
he proves himself victorious. So he puts on those negotiating skills and his vows really stems from a pagan approach towards God, which believed, and I want you to listen to this, they, he believed that God could be manipulated and influenced and directed by his own offerings. That somehow or another, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, to you know, manipulate God to do what I want him to do for me. And once again, when you read this, it sounds really pious, right? You know, God, if you do this, I will do that. But that's the way you dealt with the pagan gods who were capricious, who had, you know, um, you know uh, a nature very much akin to that of, uh, of humans. But the God of the Bible is a God who says he is holy and set apart, that there is no shadow of turning with him. He is consistent. But in our text, God remains silent. You don't hear from him because God has removed himself from this present circumstance. So before we ask this, this question about in our, in our walk with God, is it, is it a walk where we are just going through the motions? But now I want to ask you another question. In your walk with God, are you guilty of manipulation? Do we approach God simply as a means to accomplish our goals? Have you ever sought to gain God's favor by making a deal? I'll do this, God, you do that. You do realize that that's what the pagans did. God made a covenant with his people that he said he would bless them. He would provide for them. All they needed to do is to show this allegiance to him, which meant not just showing this allegiance in doing these religious things, but I showed my allegiance to God the way in which I treated the people around me. The word that God brought to these people had everything to do with the way in which I treated my neighbor, my brother. These, um, uh, the brothers of, of Jephthah kicking him out of the house, what did that have to do with this sense of solidarity that God would bring? He tells us that we were to welcome the alien into our homes. The way they were to treat one another honorably, all of those things that God put out that we were to, to demonstrate, right? Just looking as a, a summary there in the Ten Commandments. Don't lie, don't steal, don't murder, don't commit adultery. Don't covet your neighbor's stuff. That was also added to the list where it says you should have no other gods before me. You should make no, no, no graven image, no idols for yourselves, nor bow down to them. See, have you ever convinced yourself that what you wanted must be God's will? Even if it meant ignoring behavior that contradicted his word? Are, are you guilty of putting God to the test? You know, we will find God's blessings when we seek him out of a heart that desires him, not what he can give. And so, what we're going to find now is that there is a consequence to this manipulation. And so, I want to look at Judges 11, 32 through 35. It says here that Jephthah went over to fight the Ammonites. And the Lord, in his grace, even though he wasn't the one that picked Jephthah, God gave them into his hands. And he devastated 20 towns from Aurora to the vicinity of Benith, as far as Abel Keramim, and thus Israel subdued Ammon. And verse 34 says, When Jephthah returned to his home in Mitzvah, who should come out to meet him but his daughter, dancing to the sound of tambourines? She was, only, she was an only child. Except for her, he had neither son nor daughter. And when he saw her, he tore his clothes and cried, Oh, my daughter. He says, You have made me miserable and wretched because I have made a vow to the Lord that I cannot break. What is that all about? It's one of the darkest places here in the scriptures. 
See, Jephthah's vow arose from living in a very pluralistic religious environment. He, along with his fellow Israelites, were treating the Lord as if he were just one among many. You remember in chapter 10, verse 10, the narrator testifies to the fact that at this time the Israelites worshipped all these gods, right? And among them was the, was the, the gods of, the, of, of Ammon and the gods of Moab. Well, the gods of Moab was a god by the name of Shamash. And part of their ceremonies, the Moabite ceremonies, were, were known to have their leaders sacrifice their children in vows to God. Let me show you how atrocious that really was. There's a text in 2 Kings chapter 3, verses 26 through 27. It says here that the king of Moab, he saw that the battle had gone against him. And so he took with him 700 swordsmen to break through to the king of Edom, but they failed. And notice what he does then. He takes his firstborn son, who was to succeed him as king, and he offered him as a sacrifice on the city wall. Now, I, I, want, you to, I want you to notice just the vile, dark way in which people think that they can manipulate God to accomplish their purposes. And so Jephthah, he enters into the same thing. It has nothing to do with God. It has everything to do with his own standing, his own privilege, his own power. And even when the daughter comes out, it's, always, it's, it's how her coming out has now affected him. Ironically, the one who appeared to have become master of his own fate has now become a victim of his own rash word. And even in his response to the appearance of his daughter, he could not get beyond his own personal welfare. He tears his clothes and exclaims, Oh, my daughter! But his grief was not for the death of this innocent maiden, but for himself. And with his vow, Jephthah had tried to secure his present, you know, uh, status. But through this vow, he ends up sacrificing his future. And how vile and dark and sinister is that? And while he has victory over Israel's enemies, it's a victory that proves to be very, very shallow. You see, because this nation has violated the covenant, this is what God says to them early on in the book of Judges, right? It's in chapter 2, verse 20 through 22. I'm going to go back and just review this. God says, because this nation, Israel, right, has violated the covenant that I laid down for their forefathers and they have not listened to me, I will no longer drive out before them any of the nations Joshua left when he died. But I will use them to test Israel and to see whether they will keep the way of the Lord and walk in it as their forefathers did. You notice this is a test. This is a way to see whether or not they are really going to walk in God's ways. Whether or not they are really going to, um, to heed God's wisdom and counsel. What Jephthah was to discover that he has no, no progeny. There is no rest. There's only more killing. There's no, there's no standing peace. He's going to He's going to reign for no more than six years. And at the end of those six years, it says he dies and is buried in an unmarked grave. And this whole promising kind of career comes to a brief halt. So what a gruesome story. What a tragic way for this whole episode. And if it wasn't just enough, that he would take the very life of his own daughter. He also goes on to slay his fellow Israelites because of a personal dispute. And you read that in chapter 12. See, it all started because their walk with God 
It was just going through the motions. It's like we have enough of God like we use condiments. Put a little bit of salt, a little bit of pepper. Instead of allowing God and his word and his counsel to so permeate our lives that it changes the way we look at ourselves and the way in which we look out at the world. Instead of trying to manipulate God to accomplish our will and purposes, we ought to be seeking to find out his will and his ways. Because when a man walks in a way to please God, God is pleased to give to that, parent, to, that, to, that, to that person. Is not that what, is that, did we not hear that from Jesus? Did he not say to, that we ought to live this life fixing our eyes on him and running with endurance this race of faith? To examine our lives so that this fruit of this sinful nature, whether it's expressed in, in a selfish ambition or greed or hate or rage and anger or immorality, all of which it comes from a heart that needs to be cleansed. God's saying, no, 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 there's another way to live. And that other way to live is by setting your heart and affections on me. So don't go through the motions. And certainly don't live out your life of faith in a way that only seeks to manipulate God to do what you want him to do. Didn't work out well for Jephthah. Didn't work out good for Israel. All it did was underscore that they were just busy doing whatever they thought was right in their own eyes and it led to their destruction. Every civilization that existed falls because of the same course of action. No, no, God wants to bless you, but we have to do it sincerely. The prophet Jeremiah said, you will seek me and find me when you seek for me with all of your heart. May that be the lesson that we draw from Jephthah today. Let's pray. Father, I want to thank you for harsh words. I want to thank you for the way in which um, we are challenged to live life, Lord, in a way that um, demonstrates a devotion and loyalty to you, seen in the fruit, Lord, of a life that seeks to honor those who are around us, putting a putting a, a, a bridle on our own, you know, uh, passions and ambitions so that they reflect more and more of you. Because when we do that, we'll be better spouses, better parents, better workmen, better citizens. We'll care for one another deeply from the heart. It will never just be about us, it'll always be about you. And when we step into that reality, we'll find life abundant. So I pray, Lord, that all who are hearing this message would heed this, to see in the vile, dark, atrocious behavior of Jephthah a reason why we don't want to live that way. But rather, Lord, we seek our, to place our mind and our heart on things above and to run with endurance this race of faith. And I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.